we talk about chronic inflammation in the time of COVID? Well, let me first of all step back a little bit and introduce to you the work of IMHE, which is the US Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. They are one of the largest crunchers of large data. And they have come to the conclusion, and I think really this is now universally agreed on, that poor diet is the most important cause of early, which means preventable death. When you look at this in more detail and you investigate the reasons why in which poor diet makes us so sick, we can distill from this morass of data four major pathogenic mechanisms. One of these is chronic inflammatory stress, and it is not the only one. We also have to consider type B malnutrition, dysbiosis, glycemic mismatch. Those three and those four problems together are account for probably 95, maybe even more percent of the enormous problems that we see in public health today. But chronic inflammatory stress is at the core and it overlaps with all of those other three. It is particularly relevant to the uh, COVID patient because if you have chronic inflammatory stress, and it is very common now, and I'll show you why this is, uh, then you will be more at risk if you either have the virus or you have received a gene therapy of micro and macro clotting with all of the potential complications that that leads to. If you have chronic, uh, chronic inflammatory stress, uh, particularly in the intestinal tract, then this is one of the tissues where the uh, COVID virus likes to live. You will have more uh, viral translocation into the bloodstream, more viremia accompanied by endotoxemia, which creates problems of its own. If you have chronic inflammatory stress, stress there will be problems with immunosurveillance and uh, in fact with the immune system in general which will make it more likely if your innate immune system is not working properly that you will move towards uh, viral pneumonia and uh, ARDS uh, and what people still refer to as the cytokine storm and of course when that happens you're in serious trouble so chronic inflammatory stress is very relevant here and in the background of course chronic inflammatory stress has a huge responsibility for the problems of diabetes, but also cardiovascular, oncological diseases, neurodegenerative diseases. We know that chronic inflammatory stress plays a role in all of those conditions, and they are carrying on in the background while this COVID problem is taking place. And we know that in many countries, the reallocation of medical funds and personnel to COVID means that the problems with these other non-communicable health conditions are in many countries, they are becoming worse. So chronic inflammatory stress is a very substantial topic. And it turns out that it is one which is very amenable to lifestyle management. I think that we have to start to take lifestyle management very seriously indeed, because the pharmaceutical model of healthcare has simply not been very helpful. It is perhaps most highly exemplified in the United States, where the spending on healthcare outstrips any other nation in the world. But if you look at the outcomes, it has done nothing to prevent the ongoing decline in public health, which is very severe. Almost two thirds of United States adults have chronic disease, at least one, 40% of two or more, and 50% and more of elder adults have three or more diseases. Everyone is receiving polypharmacy. And the current trends are extremely negative. So the pharmaceutical approach has really been completely unable to prevent this decline in public health. One of the reasons for that is that um, this is where the multinational food industry and ultra processed foods come in. We have seen increases uh, in BMI in every single nation where these data are being recorded. And you can see United States there at the top. The problem with obesity is that it increases the risk of many different types of pathology. And you, I won't go through this whole table. I'll simply restrict my remarks to type two diabetes. Uh, we, we know the risk goes up quite dramatically as um, body mass index increases. And the problem with diabetes is that it is effectively an acceleration of the entire aging process. There is a great deal understood about the way in which diabetes accelerates the aging process. It increases the formation of senescent cells, for example. It damages immunosurveillance. Um, 
it reduces telomere length, it reduces the expression of pre-mRNA splicing factors. So these are all very deep aspects of the aging process and diabetes drives all of them, which is why there is a loss of between five and seven years of life expectancy once diabetes has been diagnosed. And the problem is that if you look at healthcare trends in, since 1950, and this is true for all the developed nations, and it is, we're seeing a very similar picture emerging in every other nation in the world that has abandoned its traditional diet, we see overweight, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and non-alcohol fatty liver disease doubling every 10 or 15 years to the point, and I'll just pick one of these out of thin air, non-alcohol related fatty liver disease is now believed to affect a quarter of the world's population. This is a truly astonishing and appalling statistic because we know that substantial numbers of these cases will progress to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and a significant number will progress to hepatocellular carcinoma. We do not have the resources to care for this demand, certainly not in the United States and I do not believe anywhere else either. If we look at some of the other long-term complications of diabetes, um, end-stage renal disease, again, this is a situation that we do not have the resources to cope with. And if we take into account some of the other aspects of the metabolic imbalances, well, hypertension now affects about 50% of all American adults. And if we add prehypertension, and we know from the records that within five to 10 years, the bulk of these people will develop clinical hypertension, that accounts for another 10 to 15%. This is a desperately unhealthy population. And because we're seeing more diabetics, the age of onset of cataracts has fallen by 20 years, and the incidence is 2.5 times higher in diabetics. Now, the point about diabetes, type two diabetes is, that the age of onset is falling. When I went to medical school in 1968, uh, we were taught that type two diabetes was a disease of old age. That was a long time ago. The situation has changed very dramatically. We now see diabetics in their 30s, 20s, teens, even in their preteens. And this is true of many of the non-communicable diseases. It's general pattern and increasing frequency and at the same time, a frightening decrease in latency. That is, we are seeing these conditions influencing and affecting progressively younger groups of subjects. If we move to neurodegenerative diseases, they've more than doubled since 1950, and the average age of dementia has fallen by 15 years since 1980, which means because we have no cures for any of these conditions, and if they cannot be cured, they simply tend to become worse over time. The death rates in the elderly subjects have increased very dramatically. In the over 75-year-old age group, they've increased 300% in men and 500% in women. Now, it's going to get worse because we know that depression over the long haul is a risk factor for dementia and for Alzheimer's. The prevalence of depression is also increasing and the age of onset has fallen here too uh, by 16 years, very much in parallel with the age of onset falling for the dementias. We know that obesity raises the risk of dementia. So here's one risk factor coming in, but there's others which I'll touch on later on. And then if we look at diseases which affect the central nervous system, the neurodevelopmental conditions, ADD, ADHD, dysphagia, dyspraxia, all of those are increasing as well. And in the last five years in the United States, there has been an increase of 78% in autism alone. These are alarming trends and there are more of them. If we consider conditions affecting the musculoskeletal system. Well, the osteoporosis, there's been a dramatic increase in osteoporotic problems. Um, and we see this manifested, for example, in the frequency of low impact fractures, which have uh, increased uh, very, very spectacularly. Most of the work here was done by Chris Obrant in Sweden, where they have excellent databases that monitor this sort of thing. And then if we go to osteoarthritis, well, the requirements for knee and hip replacement, they've increased by three and two from 93 to the period 2009, partly because we're getting heavier, but there was also convincing evidence of a deterioration in cartilage chemistry. Moving on to the immune system. Um, eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorders and asthma as well. They're analogous in a way. They have shown uh, very rapid increases. And this is true of the other allergies, including allergic dermatitis, uh, rhinitis, um, and uh, conjunctivitis. And we've seen increases in the autoimmune diseases as well. So type one diabetes has increased uh, in 
the younger uh, in, in children and young adults in the United States, it has increased by three quarters in the last 10 years. This is a part of a general trend. We're seeing incidences of the autoimmune diseases. There's a, over a hundred of them. We see all of them are increasing pretty much in lockstep. Moving to cancer, I'm going through this very quickly and we can go back to it later if you want. Non-tobacco related cancers have doubled per 100,000 since 1950. Non-tobacco related lung cancer has doubled since 2012. This is a very alarming increase and it's not because we're getting older. In fact, population ages are starting to fall in many countries now. And we can tell because cancer in teens and young adults has doubled. So the increase in cancer is not because of aging populations. One uh, cancer in particular in 22 to 37 year olds, bowel cancer has quadrupled since 1974. So a lot of people are actually walking around ill. If you have symptoms or if you've been diagnosed, well, that's one thing, but these are all conditions which have long latent preclinical periods. And when we look at populations who think that they're healthy in more detail, what we find is that a fifth of them already have <laughs> significant evidence of liver damage, about a quarter are moving towards osteoporosis, about a fifth are clearly moving towards their first heart attack or stroke, and a fifth are moving towards dementia. They're showing age-related cognitive decline. They're gradually becoming more forgetful. They are on an inevitable downhill path. And a very alarming 45% of adults aged 40 to 49 have pre-frailty syndrome, which is a preclinical forerunner to sarcopenia, which has now become a very significant cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. We have become a very sick society, but not everyone. There are people who study public health in vestigial groups, such as hunter-gatherers, such as the Hadza in Africa, or the horticulturalist cultures like the Tsimani in Bolivia, what you find there is that if one of those is, dies in an accident and you do an autopsy, you find no evidence of cardiovascular disease at all. As they get older, their blood pressure does not rise. They do not become more insulin resistant. Their prostate, the men in, in men, the prostate does not increase. In both men and women, there is no evidence, hardly any evidence at all of hypothalamic shrinkage, which does occur very commonly in the West and is a very important contributor to the developing pathology of Alzheimer's and Parkinsonism. So the people who are still living a vestigial lifestyle do not get old in the way that we do. And that leaves you to conclude that many of the signs of aging, such as the thickening of arteries, the thinning of bone, the loss of brain cells, that we thought of as deep signs of aging, as integral to the aging process, are clearly not integral at all. They are epiphenomena, they are artifacts. And what we are now beginning to realize is that they are signs not of aging, but of chronic intoxication. So that's something we can go on to talk about in a minute, but I will simply add two more signs of that of this problem that we have with chronic intoxication. Firstly, this meta-analysis carried out by Domini et al. at a number of different universities looking at intelligence using non-culturally determined methods. And what they have shown is that between the 1950 and 2020, there has been a decline in reaction speed, which amounts to a fall of an average 15 IQ points. We're getting more stupid and we are becoming less fertile as well. Another meta-analysis showing an average decline in sperm counts of almost two thirds. And this is aided and abetted by further work which shows that not only are sperm counts falling, but so is sperm mortality, mot motility and morphology. So we already know that there are uh, significant problems of infertility amongst women. We are now seeing increasing numbers of males who are subfertile or frankly clinically infertile as well. All of these are signs of populations that are being chronically poisoned. And if you weren't already convinced, we are now beginning to see that testosterone levels are falling as well. A whole series of problems because as testosterone levels fall in men, the risk of a very wide range of pathologies begins to increase. Low testosterone levels are not good for men and are associated with an increased risk of early death. So let's look at some of the aging subroutines. Uh, now I know that many of you are not necessarily scientists, so I won't get into all of these. These are some of what we think of as deep delta, the deep underlying changes that drive the aging process. 
But associated with all of them are these three factors uh, which come from our diet and lifestyle, increased inflammation, type B malnutrition, dysbiosis, and the fourth, there wasn't room for it, glycemic mismatch, all of which are caused by our lifestyle and diet, and they drive all of the aging processes as recognized by IMHE. I don't have time to go into all of them, but we do have time to look in rather more detail at chronic inflammation, what causes it, how it damages us. Now, this is a very simplified diagram, and the full diagram would take a screen probably 20 times this large. This is what happens inside an immune cell, such as a macrophage, when you have a chronic inflammatory sequence. It's a little bit too complicated to go into here. So what I'm going to talk about is the inflammasome, not the inflammasome, S-O-M-E, the zone, Z-O-N-E. This is what happens outside the macrophage in the intracellular space. This is where chronic inflammation causes tissue damage. Now, there's your archetypical cell membrane, the lipid bilayer, phosphatidyl phospholipids, those two parallel lines running across the top of the slide. And into those phosphatidyl phospholipids, we incorporate fatty acids, such as arachidonic acid, that's the omega-6 fatty acid in the box on the left, and the omega-3s, EPA and DHA, in the blue box over on the right, they're omega-3s. The ratio of the sixes and threes in your cell membranes is determined by the ratio of those fatty acids in your diet. And getting the ratio right is important because if there is an inflammatory challenge, you need to be able to mount an immune response. You need to be able to mount an inflammatory response to an invading pathogen or to physical trauma. That's where the arachidonic acid comes in. Along comes an enzyme called PLA2. It cleaves the arachidonic acid and it breaks it down into pro-inflammatory eicosanoids and cytokines, which create inflammation. Once the threat has been neutralized, you need to stop the inflammation. And that's where the compounds derived from the omega-3s come in. So you can think of this as like the accelerator and the brake of a car. And you need both. You need both to be able to switch the inflammation on with the sixes and to stop it with the threes, just as you need to have an accelerator and a brake to navigate the heavy traffic of Jakarta. For example, here's another way of looking at the inflammasome. We're looking at it in slightly more detail now. And for those of you who are clinical scientists, this is not the whole inflammatory sequence. It's much more complicated than this, but these are two of the most important components. So in the membrane, you have lipid mediators, which are being released, depending on how many sixes and threes in the membrane, which is affected by the sixes and threes in your diet. And if you have a lot of sixes and not enough threes, you're going to have edema. You get the upregulation of genes, which code for very destructive enzymes called matrix metalloproteases. And these immune cells are constantly shedding exosomes. These are intracellular messengers, which contain mRNA and DNA and enzymes and all kinds of other things. We used to call them cell dust, but we now know that they're very important ways of cells communicating with each other, both locally and remotely. And these matrix metalloprotease enzymes, when they're released into the tissues, are incredibly destructive. They cause a lot of tissue damage, which is why a healthy diet will not only give you the right six to three ratio, but it will also contain significant amounts of compounds we call polyphenols. The polyphenols have the ability to inhibit the matrix metalloproteases. It's a classic enzyme inhibitory reaction, but they also bind to DNA and messenger RNA, and they have the ability to downregulate the genes which express these tissue destructive enzymes. So this is a healthy system. This is a system with plenty of omega-3s and polyphenols. It is still capable of reacting to a threat, but it will not overreact. Here's the problem. If you move to a modern ultra-processed diet, you have a six to three ratio, which is far too high very much too high. Instead of being three or four to one, it is now on average 15 to one in Europe, 25 to one in the USA, between 80 and 120 to one in India. I'm afraid I cannot tell you yet what the average ratios are in Malaysia. I have not yet seen that data, but I will be very interested to see. But as you can see, with a ratio of sixes to threes that is very high, the first chamber in the inflammasome is overheating. Now that's fine. You may not still be in trouble if you're eating lots of polyphenols. But if you switch to a modern ultra-processed diet, the polyphenols disappear as well. So now the second 
sequence in the inflammasome is overheating. So you're getting a lot of these very destructive matrix metalloprotease enzymes being released into the tissues, and they are causing enormous tissue destruction because they dissolve the extracellular matrix. Now, this is a three-dimensional mesh of microfibers, collagen, elastin, laminectin, many other fibers, which holds all of your soft tissues together. It's different in different parts of the body. In some areas, there's more of one fiber than another, depending on whether you need elasticity or tensile strength or hydration. It's a very complex organ, and it is an organ in its own right. But the matrix metalloproteases dissolve each and every one of these different fiber types. Now, if you are familiar with the matrix metalloprotease enzymes, and you may be, it is because they are the same enzymes that are released in large amounts by the so-called flesh-eating bacteria. If you are unlucky enough to be infected by a flesh-eating bacterium, they produce large amounts of these enzymes and they dissolve everything. They dissolve skin, cartilage, bone, fascia. It's like sulfuric acid, worse in some respects. And it is the same enzymes that we produce in very small amounts over long periods of time that lead to the chronic destruction of bone, cartilage, the linings of your arteries, the brain cells if it's occurring inside the brain. So why do so many of us have these problems? And the answer is, it is the multinational food companies and the ultra processed foods that they now sell us. These foods are not toxic in the acute sense, but they are very toxic in the chronic sense because when you look at how they're composed, they have a very high ratio of omega-6s to 3s and almost no polyphenols. So two of the most important anti-inflammatory nutrients have been taken away from us. Then they take away prebiotic fibers, very little prebiotic fiber in any of these foods. And that is another very important anti-inflammatory compound inside the intestines. They also remove 1,3,1,6-beta-glucans, which damages the integrity and the functioning of the innate immune system, causing more inflammation. So four important anti-inflammatory nutrients have gone. They've been replaced by three compounds which are very pro-inflammatory, advanced glycation end products, advanced lipoxidation end products, and lipopolysaccharides. Ultra-processed foods are full of these. So the anti-inflammatory compounds have gone, pro-inflammatory compounds have been introduced, and now I hope you can begin to see why so many of us show the symptoms of chronic inflammatory stress, which are made worse by the huge amounts of sugar in the modern diet, which creates glycative reactions, which lead directly to inflammatory stress. And then everything is made worse by a pathological electrolyte ratio, far too much sodium, not enough potassium and magnesium, leading to increased smooth muscle contractility, which makes everything worse, whether it's in the respiratory tract, the cardiovascular system, or the gastrointestinal system. This is a recipe for disease. The Western food companies have become exterminator companies. These ultra-processed foods are killing us in large numbers because not only do they make us chronically inflamed, they also cause something called type B malnutrition. Now, type A malnutrition is what you find in the medical textbooks where there is a lack of micronutrients and calories. We think of pictures like this. And in the developed nations, we do not see this very often. What we see is type B malnutrition. If people are living in cities or towns and they're white collar, they're not using more than 2000 kilocalories a day. If they're eating a lot of empty calories, such as sugars and plant oils, what we see is that they're low in the vitamins, in the trace elements, in a range of phytonutrients, in cyanogens, methyl group donors, prebiotic fibers, the list goes on and on. They're low in everything. And people with type B malnutrition look like this. So these American children, have chronic inflammation, they have type B malnutrition, they have dysbiosis. And that is why when we look at them in detail, we find that they are not healthy at all. They are already beginning to show the signs, the early signs of those diseases, which will over time come to the surface, become clinically obvious, will make them sick and will kill them years before their time. So what are ultra processed foods? I've mentioned them. Well, processed foods, you can still recognize ultra processed foods. Part of the definition is that when you look at them, you can't actually see what's in them. Another way of defining them is that they have six or more ingredients, or they contain compounds such as emulsifiers, acidulants, E numbers. That is, you know, these are all clues that give you an idea whether this is an ultra processed food. And if it is, don't eat it. Sugar-sweetened beverages like Coca-Cola, candy, ice cream, breakfast cereals, cookies, 
all the foods you like to eat because the food companies are very concerned to make these foods delicious. They have ways of doing that, which make them almost addictive. They're not interested in our health and they make these foods taste good by putting in large amounts of empty calories, which is why the more ultra processed foods you eat, the more likely you are to have a weight problem. And this creates a paradox. What we see is that the people who are the heaviest, who are eating the most empty calories have the worst nutritional status. They are overnourished on the outside, inside they are starving. And that is another reason why the more of these ultra processed foods, the more you die. A 10% increase in the consumption of ultra processed food raises the risk of cancer by 10%, type two diabetes by 15%, early death by 14%. And it's dose related. It also accelerates the aging of the immune system, causes increased inflammation and an increased risk of sepsis. Now I'm cheating here because that was a study with lab rats that like to eat modern foods just as much as we do, and it kills them in just the same way that it kills us, which is why life expectancy is falling. For the last five years in the United States, it's not just COVID, it's not just the deaths of despair, but if you look at the details released by the NIH, it also includes sepsis, just like the lab rats, diabetic complications and neurodegenerative disease. In the UK, we are following in lockstep, coming soon, all of these other countries and probably India, and it may well be Malaysia as well because that reflects how much ultra processed foods we eat. In North America, they getting almost 60% of all their calories from these ultra processed foods. Britain is next, as you can see in red. Then you have Ireland, Germany, Poland, and Finland. Australia is right up there as well, but I can't show it on that map. I'm not quite sure what the situation is in Malaysia. Perhaps someone can inform me. Best thing you can do is to stop eating ultra processed food and switch to a variant of the Mediterranean diet, which is highly protective. You see a reduction of risk of between a third and a half in these and in more conditions. But we now know a diet that's even more protective, which was the so-called mid-Victorian diet eaten in England between 1850 and 1900, made possible by two historical events. The agricultural revolution, which increased the availability of good and fresh food very considerably, and the industrial revolution, which brought this agricultural productivity into the cities where people worked. And they worked manually with their hands and with their backs. This has been studied in great detail they were working for a total of 60 to 75 hours of physical activity a week. These people did not just go to the gym once or twice a week, they lived and worked in a gym, which had a huge effect on their calorie requirements. They were burning between three and 7,000 calories a day, an average of over 4,000. Very little tobacco or salt or spirits or processed foods, lots of omega-3s, salmon, and seafoods were very cheap at that time, very little omega-6 because the plant oils had not yet been stabilized and they were eating large amounts of fruits and vegetables. All of this is a matter of record. So they're eating lots of omega-3s and polyphenols. It's a super Mediterranean diet. And then that shows through in their life expectancy. If we compare life expectancy then to life expectancy in the equivalent class today, we can see that women have lost three years, have gained, I'm sorry, women have gained three years, but men have lost three years. Despite modern surgery, pharmaceuticals, diagnostics. And the only reason why women have gained three years is because of improved gynecology and obstetrics and contraception. Because in the 19th century, women were typically going through a cycle of 30, 35, even 40 years of continuous pregnancy and childbirth. And that was actually a rather dangerous experience for them that brought down life expectancy a lot. So women's life expectancy has increased, men's has fallen by between three and four years. Not only did they have as good or a better life expectancy than we do, they had a better health expectancy. We can expect to spend the last 10% of our lives in declining health. The mid-Victorian elderly were usually extremely healthy. We have many, many records of men in their 70s, 80s, even in their 90s, who were still capable of working in the fields and putting in a full day's work every day. But when they finally came to the end of their working lives, they would be sent to an institution called the workhouse, which meant exactly what it said. They were expected to work to pay for their upkeep as long as they lived. And we know that they did until the last weeks and sometimes hours before they died. When we look at their autopsies 
and the Victorian doctors were doing tens of thousands of these. We can see that they did have cancer, heart disease, diabetes, dementia, but at very low rates, only 10% of the rates that we see today. And this matches contemporary studies of vestigial cultures that I mentioned earlier in this presentation. Here's another way of looking at it today, 1997, causes of death in England and Wales. And you can see the bottom two elements in that table, cancers and diseases of the circulatory system. They kill about two thirds of us. That is what we expect. In 1880, a population of the equivalent age, those diseases do not kill 66%. They only kill about 6%. In other words, the burden of chronic degenerative disease at that time was only 10% of what it is today. Now that tells us two things. Firstly, almost 90% of the chronic degenerative non-communicable disease we see today is avoidable. And secondly, that 10%, that should ring a bell. If you ask an oncologist or a cardiologist or a neurogeriatrician, how many of your patients have strong genetic risk factors, they will typically say about 10%. If we look at the mid-Victorians, it is only that 10% who were developing these pathologies. Everybody else was protected. And for those of you who are skeptic, as you should be, and oncologists, perhaps in the audience, you are familiar with some of these risk factors and protective factors. And what we can tell from our study of the 19th century is that today we are completely unprotected, whereas the Victorian was completely protected. Now, if you are forming cancer cells in your body every day, which we believe we are today, our defenses against cancer are very degraded. And so a cancer cell has a much greater chance of achieving clinical success than it would do if it had emerged in the body of a Victorian in whom every protective system against cancer was fully maintained. So let's take a look at someone in 2021 who's eating an ultra processed diet and therefore has a very high six to three ratio and no polyphenols. They will have chronic inflammatory stress, which may manifest as an arthritis, as coronary artery disease, as non-alcohol related fatty liver disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or it may present as migraine or depression or a neurodegenerative disease or as a cancer. But this person, if he's eating ultra processed foods also has a gram negative dominant microbiome, which means that they also have chronic inflammatory stress in the intestinal tract, specifically in the large bowel. So what we do in patients like this, we put a combination of omega-3 and amphiphyl polyphenols in place. The amphiphyl polyphenols are very important because they act as chaperones for omega-3s in the marine food chain and in the body and are anti-inflammatory in their own right. When we do this, we see inflammation being reduced very significantly in almost every tissue of the body, with the exception of the gut, where we need to use different tools. In the gut, what we do is we use prebiotic fibers. Now, this is a pre-transitional gut. That is the gut of someone who is eating a traditional diet, which contained large amounts of prebiotic fiber. The probiotic species, which are broadly saccharolytic, they like to eat these fibers. They remain in the lumen of the gut where the fibers are, they break them down and they form postbiotics such as butyrate. And this creates a very healthy environment for our colonocytes down at the bottom, the cells that line the colon. This is an environment which is anti-inflammatory and chemoprotective. That is a healthy situation. The ultra processed diet takes these fibers away. And so the probiotic species die. They're replaced by these red bacteria, which are proteolytic. They tend to be gram negative. They have the ability to destroy the mucosal layers and they come into direct contact with the colonocytes causing enormous amounts of chronic inflammatory stress, IBS, IBD, leaky bowel syndrome, leading to increased viremia, bacterial translocation and endotoxemia. This is a situation where there is more inflammation, more cancer, more NAFLD, more of many, many different kinds of problems, which is why a diet deficient in prebiotic fiber increases the risk of early death by 30%. What we do is we put the fibers back into the diet where they always used to be, restore a gram positive dominant microbiome full of probiotic species. And at that point, the environment is once again, anti-inflammatory and chemoprotective. 
These are the prebiotic fibers. As you can see, they're carbohydrates. This is FOS. You can't use very much of this. It has a very narrow therapeutic index. And so we combine it with large amounts of inulin, which is a longer molecule. Therefore, it ferments more slowly. Larger amounts of 1,3,1,4 beta-glucans from oats, slower fermentation. Larger amounts of resistant starch, again, from sources such as green banana, very complex molecule, very slow fermentation. And you need all of them because when these fibers enter the large bowel, they're not digested, everything is moving. So the FOS starts to change the microbiome in the ascending colon, and it is then taken over by the slower inulin, by the 1,3,1,4 beta-glucans, and finally by the resistant starch. In this way, we can transform the microbiome from gram-negative positive, ne gram-negative dominant anti and, and pro-inflammatory to gram-positive dominant and anti-inflammatory throughout the entire large bowel. The biggest data that we have, this is a WHO study from 2019, showed that higher fiber intakes reduced early death by 30%, so it's chemoprotective and vascular protective. Um, their data indicates that about 30 grams of fiber a day is adequate. More than that gives you better protection. It's dose related. The problem is now that we are eating modern foods, nine out of 10 of us do not eat enough fiber. We only manage to eat about half what the WHO considers to be the minimum or entry level of dose. So the average diet contains 15 grams of total fiber. Only about a quarter of that is these all important prebiotic fibers. And the WHO data implies we should double that, which is what we do in a blended prebiotic product that we're using in great success now in 50 countries. There's two more sources of chronic inflammatory stress, and one of those is deep intra-abdominal adipose tissue, which has a tendency to become infiltrated by macrophages, which then produce pro-inflammatory adipokines, which is why this kind of fat is so dangerous, because it's physically very close to the heart, liver, kidneys, and you're flooding them with inflammatory mediators, causing local tissue damage. Not a good thing. You're increasing the formation of senescent cells, and they form more senescent cells and the organs aging actually accelerates. So what we do is we add a blend of micro and phytonutrients that are fat soluble antioxidants, very specifically designed to stabilize deep adipose tissue. And we're able to stop inflammation there as well. There is only one more major source of chronic inflammatory stress in most people, and that is periodontal disease, which is very common and becomes more common with age. It's not a trivial condition. It's a very serious one, and it increases the risk of Alzheimer's and Parkinsonism because inflammatory mediators and bacterial metabolites move retrograde through the olfactory nerve and are able to get into the brain directly. And because this is occurring in the mouth, the same toxic compounds are swallowed leading to resistant hypertension, prostate, and uh, pancreas, and breast cancer. So what we would like to do is to find a way of alleviating this inflammation as well. And we have found one uh, under the ocean, not the fish this time, but the seaweeds. Now, when you pull seaweed out of the ocean, you'll notice the first thing is it's very slippery. The reason these seaweeds are slippery is because they are coated with fucoidans, which are polysulfated oligosaccharides a little bit like heparin. They're very slippery, the biological equivalent of Teflon. When you eat these, they get into the bloodstream, they're secreted in the saliva, and as they bathe the roots of the teeth, they dislodge bacterial plaque. And you can test this for yourself using plaque disclosing tablets. And after about two to three weeks, the tartar in the teeth, which is mineralized plaque, actually loses its structure and falls away from the roots of the teeth. And you feel as if you've just been to the dental hygienist. Inflammation stops, the gums stop bleeding, and some Japanese data shows that if you can do this, the teeth actually re-anchor themselves. If they're loose, they re-anchor themselves back into the gums. And at this point, the inflammation in the mouth stops, and the risk factors associated with it disappear as well. We don't think that everybody should be medicalized. We use a test which is run by a third-party independent forensic analytical laboratory. It's just a pinprick. You can see for yourself whether your 6 to 3 ratio is in the green zone or in the red. If it's in the red zone, do something about it. So what we're trying to do is to reduce chronic inflammatory stress. We're trying to alleviate type B malnutrition and dysbiosis, and we do it in this way. We have 
this combination of omega-3 and amphiphyl polyphenols, which stops inflammation in almost every tissue with the exception of the gut, where we need to use blended time-released prebiotic fibers. And then for deep abdominal adipose tissue and periodontal disease, we have Extend and a new product, which is just about to come on stream. So this is a systems approach to inflammation, type B malnutrition and dysbiosis. As I said, we have a population of about a quarter of a million now who follow this regime. They constitute a man-made blue zone. They have extraordinary health outcomes. Many of them have chronic degenerative disease when they come to us. Typically over a period of four to six months, they go into remission. Many of them become drug-free. And out of all of this number, we've had, as I said, many tens of thousands of cases of COVID, only one hospitalization, not one death. If you give the body what it needs to take care of itself, to repair, to monitor, and to maintain, it is capable of doing wonderful things. And it turns out that when you do this, the bulk of the aging process, as we know it, goes into remission. We still get old, we will still die, but we can do it in a much more civilized way. And we can extend healthy, functional middle midlife, I believe, by between 10 and 25 years. Thank you. I wanted to leave time for questions. So let me stop the share at this point and throw the floor open 